Thanks. Um, I'll race through a 20-minute presentation in five to ten minutes, promise, okay? Um, I'm really actually an admirer of the way that these two guys have been dancing over these cables here. So if I go <laughs> flat on my face in a minute, it's because of these cables here. Um, I'm hoping my brain will be awake enough to talk to you today because I'm actually on leave this week. Ah, So, you know, I've, I've attempted to gear up a bit in order to come and talk to you today. So this is, for those of you who know me, you know, I'm, I'm just a GP. I've been involved in mental health work for quite a few years now. Commissioning is new to me. I'm not an expert in commissioning. But in some respects, I hope that a grassroots perspective is helpful for the time being. Um, so I'm going to talk about... Uh, I, I thought, first of all, and you've already heard a bit about this particular day, what, what's out there already, you know, a huge number of services within mental health, and it's extremely confusing for us, I think. I'm going to tell you a little bit about some survey results, which a lot of you probably did respond to, what the CCG's priorities are, and the intentions, the commissioning intentions within that. So look how long a list that is, and in fact, the screen can't even go down far enough to show you everything that's on there. Um, You'll look at some of that and think, yeah, of course, I know about that. But there are other bits on there that you might forget are part of mental health services. Um, there is a voluntary sector. I've put CAMS in at the bottom here as well. Um, but, but this is a lot of stuff that our main provider um, provides for us. And it's very complicated. And in my view, and I think the services themselves would agree, that's part of the problem. And this has been driven by the National Service Framework uh, that came along in 1999. There was a requirement to set up lots of these teams, and it has destroyed the old community mental health teams that a lot of us remember from years ago. So that's just a reminder as to how much is out there. Okay, so why did we do a survey? Um, well, when I came into post uh, about six months ago, uh, one of the real gripes from GPs was that when we need to get patients seen urgently, we can't. The crisis team give us excuses. Um, that was largely what I was hearing from Torbay GPs. Um, I didn't know so much about the South Devon GPs. So we thought we would survey a couple of things. We would ask you your views on the, your experience of the crisis and home treatment team. We would ask you about your experience of urgent reviews that you've made to the wellbeing and access team. So that's, you know, your old community mental health teams at Waverley, Culverhay and the South Devon equivalents. And also your views of the depression and anxiety <coughs> service. So here are the responses. Um, and I just, I thought it would be interesting to show you. So out of about 200 GP, 64 responses, not bad actually to get a third of GPs to respond to a survey. Thank you. Well done. Um, it means it matters. So if we asked you to score it out, out, to, out from 0 to 10, um, and this was the Torbay and South Devon view of responses to the crisis, uh, by your experience, sorry, of the crisis service. But there is a difference between Torbay at the top, and sorry it's gone off the screen, that's the South Devon at the bottom. So it was interesting that we'd been hearing from Torbay GPs that the crisis service was crap, but actually it appears you think it's more crap in South Devon. <laughs> I'm just telling you these things because we will need to address them. The next one is your experience of urgent referrals to the access and wellbeing team. So these are people where you don't think they're about to harm themselves or somebody else. You don't think the risk is high enough, but you are concerned that they must be seen within five days. You're making a referral, probably to the duty worker. You might be ringing them up. You might be faxing them at the access and wellbeing team. How do you view that? Okay, that's the overall view. It's a bit skewed to the left, isn't it? Low point score for that. But again, interestingly, although I'd been hearing a lot from Torbay GPs about things not going well, it's worse, your view of it is worse in South Devon. We know that there are differences in the way that the teams work across the patch, um, and that's something that we will be looking at as commissioners with Devon Partnership Trust. And finally, in the survey, we asked you what you thought about the Depression Anxiety Service. It's gone to the right. If we had a swingometer, it would be over here somewhere. But this is a very different service, isn't it? It has a quick response, generally. They have had staffing problems, so their response and assessment time hasn't always been brilliant. It varies. They're looking at ways of dealing with that huge sort of change in their staffing levels. But we seem to be much happier 
with the way that this service deals actually with a huge number of people. You know, in Torbay, it's three and a half thousand people a year go through this service. That's a lot of patients. But actually, they're seen quickly, they're dealt with quickly, they receive their psychological therapy quickly. But we are talking about people with, generally, a lower level of need. Now, previously, they'd been neglected because services were looking at higher level need. So this is a good thing. What are the differences between Torbay and South Devon? Again, Torbay GPs are really, really happy with their service. South Devon GPs less so. So for us as commissioners, this is a starting point. This is looking at where are we now. Okay, um, for those of you aware of CCG jargon, there is a thing called a plan on a page. This is a, a thing that summarises all the, the clinical commissioning group's intentions and it's being adopted across the country. And in mental health, these are the four priority areas. And I just want to talk about each of those in reverse order, just to keep you awake and on your toes. Because this is the simplest one, in a way, down the bottom. Simplest to understand. There is a national dementia strategy, it's a given, it must happen, and Nick Cartmel, who's in the other room, so if you're going to stay on, you'll go and see Nick talk to you in a minute, he's going to talk to you more about the national dementia strategy. Working up, we want people to have a better experience, and this includes children, although that's not part of my remit, of psychological therapies and crisis services. I've talked about the crisis, so I'll park that now, Psychological therapies, again, as GPs, you will know that some of your most needy patients who need high-intensity psychological therapy wait over a year for it. And it's, it's shocking. Some of those patients may access it through the health psychology services that David talked about, that if you've got a physical health problem, that actually might find you a way in. But at the higher level needs for psychological therapies, people wait for ages. So one of our priorities this year as commissioners is that we're putting in an incentive, a financial incentive, uh, what's called a sequin, to try and incentivise DPT to bring those waiting times down. Let's go up a bit further. Um, those services that I showed you at the beginning, there were loads of them. It's really confusing. Who do you ring? When do you ring them? Where's the phone number? We want a single point of access to mental health services. In theory, that will work really smoothly. There are actually parts, parts around the country, sites that I've spoken to, where they've implemented this, and it's been chaos. So we need to learn from that as to why it's not worked so well. But in theory, a single point of access for you as referrers makes accessing mental health care much easier. And then this was the bit that fits in with, what, again, what David was saying about um, having workers from mental health come into primary care and working more closely with them. Again, those of us who've been knocking around for a while remember that in the days of CMHTs, we often used to meet with a member of the team. They'd come into the practice, and that dialogue allowed us to learn more about mental health, about how the services worked, to discuss patients who were presenting problems, to be a bit more proactive, to anticipate stuff. We're all so busy now, and that includes mental health services, under so much pressure that that, fault, that went away years ago for most of us. And we're looking to try and bring that back. It probably needs something like a virtual ward model for mental health. But what I want to do is to look at practices, individual needs, and how they, because you need to decide yourselves, how would you best work with a mental health worker? And which <coughs> mental health worker should that be? And how are they going to find the time to get there? I think it's important enough that we need to work on this. So you've just seen the four priorities. There they are. And then there's a long list. As I said, it's on the list. <coughs> These are other things that we want to crack on and start sorting out. In an environment where there's not much new money, as Sean said, apart from one or two specific areas. So we've got to try and be a bit clever about this. Uh, and I'm relying on lots of other cleverer people than me to assist in that. So that's the list. On there, you'll see, I hope, things that ring bells with you. You know, eating disorders patients, it's really hard to get them a service, particularly if they're not really sick. If they're really sick, then things happen. But all the way up to there, all the way up to getting to really sick, it's a struggle. I won't go through all this list, but I hope there are things on there. Uh, ADHD have been prescribing issues lately for adults. Uh, a shared care guideline is imminent. We're waiting for the LMC to finally tick that box. Um, liaison psychiatry we've heard a lot about medically unexplained symptoms, etc., etc. 
So as far as I'm concerned, that is it for a presentation. I want to tell you or remind you, because I've told some of you in the past about this website, and I'm going to spend 30 seconds showing it to you. If you have trouble locating resources for patients with mental health problems, and I'm afraid this is only Torbay at the moment, and we want to extend it to South Devon, then Torbay Mental Health website uh, is where you go. And I'm, as I say, apologies for, um, for South Devon doctors because that's not available for you at the moment. I'm hoping that the projector's going to wake up to my iPad in a minute and realise that it's there. Um, how many of you can, so how many of you know about this website? Ian, Ian, if you're called Ian, you know about the website. Brilliant. Um, this website is, uh, has been produced by uh, Steve Smith, who is now retired CPN, uh, used to work at Waverley, for no money at all, really. Um, very small amount of money. We need to extend it, as I say, to South Devon, but, but basically, I'm showing it's it to tormented you. Tormented in another light. Tormented is what it used to be called, but that name's a little bit dodgy. But, <laughs> but it stood for Torbay Mental Health <laughs> Education. <laughs> Um, so if you tap on, let's say, let's, let's, let's go to Ian Walker's place, let's go to Brixham. If I tap on Brixham, it will bring me up a list of uh, all the things that you might want to look for in Brixham. Um, now, if you don't know about this and you're a GP in Torbay, this is brilliant. It's only available at the moment to professionals. I think there's every reason for it to become available to patients as well. Um, in Torbay, again, we have a mental health information service which is largely paper-based, although there's a PDF file you can look at on the web for patients to look at. We're looking at integrating the two, but obviously we wanted to cover Torbay and South Devon um, as well. So this is my last click, but if I click on depression, you will see that there is a massive range, starting with statutory services, but then going down through other options and things that you could do. Brilliant, isn't it? Thanks very much. Yeah. You're a professional. <laughs> um, would you like me to... must be a block somewhere to the general public. Sorry, how... Can I, can I Google it? Um, there is... Um, do you know... Now, I, do you, yeah, I know what you mean. You should have a user, yeah, you should, just going back, a username and a password were issued back along for it. And I know, yeah, I don't even think about it now because it's, it's shortcutted on mine and I bypass that. That's going to be a real stumbling block for me. If I can't get online... You think you've got a problem. We're in South Devon, we couldn't get it. Yeah, exactly. So I can get my computer guy at work to find out. Yeah, if you've written down that website... Um, if, that's, that's the point. If I, if I can't go pins, it's yeah. not happening in no, consultation. No, sure, sure. Um, <laughs> and I know that's a really, really rubbish offering. As far as I know, it's not available to the public. Yeah. Saying that, I could Google it now, but we've got other no, no, better no, things to no, do. But no, I might no, do it in the break. Okay, get, I might Google some, it and I'll see if I can get on. But it didn't yeah, used to be public. It's public access now. It's public access. Google it. Forget everything I said.